Hey listeners, to celebrate the launch of this podcast, we're running a contest. There are many ways to enter. Subscribing to the podcast, leaving reviews, sharing news about it on social media, and you can even do all of them for more chances to win. First prize is a brand new pair of Apple Beats solo headphones, and there are other prizes too. What are you waiting for? For all the details and to enter, go to edinfinitum.com. That's www.ed-infinitum.com and click on Launch Contest in the upper left corner. Now, enjoy the episode. Hello, and welcome to Ed Infinitum, the podcast that makes school the subject of study. I'm your host, David Nuremberg. Episode number one, why the USA doesn't really have a public school system. I've had the privilege of consulting and presenting at schools in several countries, mainly in Asia, Japan, China, Korea, Turkmenistan. And one of the hardest things for me to explain to my international colleagues is that, unlike in their country, unlike in nearly every nation on the planet, the United States of America does not have a public school system. I know that might sound like a strange comment to make. I mean, wasn't I employed for 20 years by our public school system? But bear with me, and you'll see what I mean. Because the fact that we don't really have a public school system lies at the core of so much of the present problems you might hear talked about regarding education in our country. Now, just in case I have any listeners from the UK or its former sphere of influence, I know that the term public school for you folks refers to a privately operated school, um, often a boarding school, more analogous to what we might call a prep school in the USA. The definition used by the USA is the one I'll be talking about, a school funded from tax revenue offering its services free at the point of delivery, and in some way administered or conducted by some government agency. If you're curious, by the way, American listeners, such schools in the UK are called state schools. In most other countries, this government agency is the national or federal government, under the auspices of some ministry or department of education. And while there is some delegation of powers at the regional level, Generally speaking, all decisions about the structure of schooling and the curriculum, what material is to be taught, are made at this federal, top-down level. When one speaks of a public school reform in these countries, it generally means that some high-level bureaucrats or politicians in the capital have laid out new rules that all schools in the nation must now follow. Now, whether these schools actually successfully implement these new rules is a whole different and complex story, but the governance structure, the way things are supposed to work, is never in doubt. Decisions get made at the top, and these decisions apply to schools across the nation. Similarly, The lion's share of funding is raised through taxation on a national scale and distributed by that central education authority out to the schools as it sees fit, according to whatever rules or system they use. This picture is utterly different from what we have in the United States. Sure, we have a federal department of education, but it wasn't created until 1978, which makes it younger than I am. It also has remarkably little influence or power over American public schools. It doesn't set curriculum. It doesn't certify teachers. It doesn't mandate certain structures of schooling or instructional techniques. Importantly, with just a few exceptions, most of them related to special education, it does not collect or administer funding for schools. Its role is basically restricted to serving as something of a bully pulpit through which a given presidential administration can forward certain general suggestions or offer up limited packages of grants and aid. At most, any given public school in the United States may be drawing about maybe 7% or so of its budget from the U.S. Department of Education, and through it, funding levied through national taxation. Well, sure, you might say, we've always had a healthy tension in the United States between federal versus state powers. I won't detail that all here because, frankly, it's much more fun to learn it from listening to the rap battles from the musical Hamilton. And since there's nothing in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights about a public school system, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments relegate everything not mentioned in the Constitution to the auspices of the states. Yet the states also play a remarkably small role in the practice of public schooling, although they've played more of a role since 2001 than they did before. Those changes will be the subject of a future episode about the No Child Left Behind Act and the standards-based education reform movement that birthed it. Until 2001, state departments of education were mostly concerned with certifying and licensing teachers and schools, 
as well as, like the federal government, being a public voice in advocacy for education in general and the particular policies of whatever government was in power. Now, states always have had broad regulatory powers over education within their borders, but how much of this the state delegated out to lower government entities could be substantial and varied widely from state to state. It was only after 2001 that all states took on the role of establishing and dictating required curriculum. Some had done so before, but many hadn't. And importantly, creating data collection mechanisms, i.e. standardized tests, used to assess and evaluate students and schools alike on their performance in meeting those learning goals. Yet, even today, any given school in America receives maybe 20% of its funding from taxes levied and distributed by the state government. So where does the lion's share of a school's money? Possibly as much as three quarters of it, as well as the lion's share of a school's governance come from? The locality. The city, town, or district. That's right. Every city, town, parish, or consolidated rural region funds, operates, and even today dictates much of what is taught and how it is taught within their own schools. These decisions are officially the purview of local, democratically elected school boards and committees, although in practice much of this power gets delegated to superintendents, curriculum coordinators, school principals, department chairs, and, yes, individual teachers themselves. That's what I mean when I say the U.S. doesn't have a public school system. Rather, it has about 13,500 of them, give or take, with even more variation within those districts, or even from classroom to classroom within a single school. Think about that. 13,500 different approaches to teaching and learning. That's beyond a patchwork quilt. It's a raging blizzard full of unique flakes of snow. 13,500 different approaches and 13,500 different amounts of funding available for it. That's because funding is assessed on a local or district level as well, via property taxes. So about 75% of a school's budget is based on both the value of its real estate tax base and the rate at which local government decides to assess taxes on it. Which means that one district, say Lexington, Massachusetts, can have a budget of $138 million to be distributed among 7,000 or so students, while just 13 miles away, the city of Chelsea, Massachusetts, has only $96 million available to educate the same number of students. That's right, a 13-mile difference can give you a 30% smaller budget. It's sometimes called the devil's bargain, local control, local funding. The reason we have it has to do with the history of how public schooling came to be in our nation, created piecemeal, town by town and state by state, as opposed to from any top-down or constitutional mandate. The logic can be read either as, you want us to pay for our own schools? Fine, we get to control what's taught in them. Or conversely, you want to control what's taught at your school? Fine, you pay for it. So that is how we can have a country where, in one state, in one town, you might have teachers calling that little internal conflict in the early 1860s the Civil War, and another calling it the War of Northern Aggression. You can get evolution taught in one school, and intelligent design in another. Shakespeare here but not there. Spanish here but French there, and Chinese over there. Some would say this is a good thing. Democracy in action. Citizens can tailor their schools to serve the specific needs and ideologies of the local population. And you can either view this as an obstacle to national unity or a celebration of local independence as you see fit. That's America for you. But those vast differences in funding that go along with differences in local control, those have enormous impact when you couple them with the laws that mandate that students can only attend schools in the districts in which they live. Now, there are some exceptions. You can homeschool if you have the requisite time and expertise. You can send your children to private school if you have the resources. And those with less means can access a handful of voucher, charter, and voluntary busing options. But the emphasis here is on handful. 91%, 91% of students in America attend their local public school, according to the National Center for Education Statistics. This isn't all by choice. Given the economic and logistical challenges to buying or even renting property in affluent cities and towns, let alone the racial exclusion factors like redlining and restrictive covenants, which, while no longer around, 
have a legacy that gives us the massive school segregation that still exists today. If you are a child born into a low or even middle income family, you, my friend, are pretty much stuck with a school with fewer resources, less well compensated and therefore usually less skilled teachers, all of whom are dealing with a student population that most needs adequate funding and super skilled educators. This is what education writer Jonathan Kozel called savage inequalities. In future podcasts, we'll dive more into the history of both the creation of American public schools and of the often race-based policies that gave us two different kinds of school segregation, one that is now illegal and one that is thriving and more pronounced than ever. As mentioned earlier, we'll also talk about the No Child Left Behind Act of 2001 and what it both improved and made worse about the savage inequalities of our public school systems, plural. But for now, the next time someone, either a foreigner or a fellow American, asks you about the public school system in our country, remind them that we don't have one. We have a whole bunch of them. And the highly variegated experience this translates into for students will, or at least should, inform literally every discussion of what goes on in schools and classrooms in the United States. That's all the time we have for now. Class dismissed, and we'll see you next time. I hope you enjoy listening to this podcast. If you liked this episode, please write us a review on iTunes and like us on our Facebook page. If you really liked this podcast, please consider visiting our website, www.ed-infinitum.com, and making a donation to keep it running. Otherwise, in the grand tradition of underfunded public schools, we'll be reliant on only what we can make from bake sales. The website is the place to go if you want to suggest a topic or send me an email for any other reason. Our theme music is Happy Schoolmaster by Mind Music ID. Thanks again for listening, and remember, every day brings us opportunities to learn something new. Still with us? Awesome, you get a treat. This week's intriguing education fact. In Japanese schools, there usually aren't cafeterias. Students bring their own lunches and clean up after they're done. They are also responsible for the regular cleaning of the school building, which both saves on custodial staff and teaches personal responsibility. Bye now!